right, we're in the Beatitudes, and I know you remember the, what we're doing with it. You know, the Jesus at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, which is, um, I've described it as being the constitution of the kingdom of God. Well, at the beginning of it, he, he gives uh, eight uh, ways, eight significant uh, teachings on how to be happy in life. And he uses the word, or the Bible uses the word blessed, because uh, it, it's, uh, it's markerios, which can be translated blessed, and is translated blessed in many areas, but it also could be translated happy. And, and of course, the Beatitudes are all about happiness, about how to be happy in life, how to be blessed in life, how to be happy in life. And the reason Jesus taught, tells us how to be happy in life is because he knows that's what we all want. That's what we all need, and, and we're going to be searching for it, and it, we're going to be searching in all the wrong places, and, and we're going to miss it because we don't, know, we don't know how to find happiness. And so he said, here, let me help you, and he, he set down eight, uh, eight principles here, eight, eight uh, steps, eight leaderships to, uh, to be happy in life, to be blessed in life, and we call them the Beatitudes. He didn't call them the Beatitudes. They were just named the Beatitudes by men because that's what they're about. They're about attitudes that you're supposed to be. That's exactly right. These are the attitudes that Jesus had. Jesus said, all right, do, have this attitude and you'll be blessed in life. You'll be happy in life. And he started with the verse one and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, spirit. happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of he heaven. Happy are those who recognize their need of the Lord. It's what that, what that means. Those who, who are humble, uh, those who see their need for someone higher than themselves, and they pursue that, they're going to be happy and blessed because humility in life brings joy and happiness. And the second one, blessed are those who mourn. Everybody say, not moan. <laughs> there, is a, there is a difference between mourning and moaning, right? Yeah. Mourning is legitimate grief. Mourning, mourning is, is, is hurt or pain. Moaning is just uh, you know, complaining and, and griping about things. And this beatitude said you can be happy if you are legitimately grieving. Why? Because he says you're going to be comforted. Yeah, yeah. And, and what does that mean? It means God is going to come. The word comfort in, in the Greek here is a compound word, and it means with strength. So God's not, you know, God, you write God a note, and, and, and God, and you pray, and you ask the Lord for whatever it is that's, that's, that's mourning inside of you, whatever pain it is, and God doesn't just write a little note back to you and send it down and say, thinking about you in bad days. God does something. God comes back with strength. So in other words, God's going to come back and do what's necessary in your life to, to, to comfort you, to, to come with strength. And so Jesus said, you can be blessed when you're torn up and sad on the inside because God's going to do something about it. He's going to come with strength. Yeah, Tan. during times like that that I've experienced God at a whole new level. Right. That's beautiful, yeah. That's right. It is. It is. And, and there are many things that we go through that we couldn't learn any other way. And I know, you know, I know it sounds uh, terrible, but that's how God grows us and teaches us and how when we get desperate in our lives, we will listen to what God's saying, and that we want, when you're fat, happy, and sassy, you know, nobody can tell you anything. You, you, you got all the answers, you wide open, you know, you're, you're whistling down the way, bless, bless, bless. But when you get desperate, uh, boy, uh, God can pour things through you and in you and to you that you never could get any other way. So he says, blessed are those who mourn. And then last week, blessed are the meek, happy are the meek, 
uh, the meek means uh, self-controlled. It means uh, uh, somebody that's strong that can control their strength. Strength under control is what I, I've interpreted meekness as. And so you're ha happy when you can control your power or your strength. And I mentioned that this is in t totally in connection with uh, other people. In other words, this beatitude is saying you're blessed when you, can, when, when you can control your attitude and your power, especially when it comes to other people. You don't get out of control with other people, and, you're gonna, and, you, and the world is yours, is what he said. You, can, you control yourself with other people, and you don't blow up and blast up and hurt people and you know, all of that. Then the world is, is yours. And today, now the fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I know that you can see here, and, and I know because of you know, your maturity, you, you recognize that hunger and thirst are the key words to this particular beatitude, that you would hunger and thirst after, after righteousness, and God's going to do something. God's going God's to gonna fill you. You know, in America, most of us don't really know what real hunger is or, or real thirst is. Oh, I'm not saying we don't get hungry because we all get hungry, but we're just hungry till we can get to the next uh, fast food place or, you know, we can quench our hunger very quickly uh, and we don't really know what, what, how to endure real hunger and, and starvation in life, and the same way with thirst. And you know, we're thirsty till we can get to the next fountain or the next vending machine. But what God is saying here to us is that uh, you, you hunger and you thirst for something that really you're not even aware of what you're hungering and thirsting for. He said, you know what it is? You're hungering and thirsting for something that God put on the inside of you when he created you, that if, if he didn't tell you what you're hungry and thirsty for, you would miss it because you're not, you're not aware of the fact that you were created by God. And, and remember John, the gospel of John chapter one, Jesus was talking and he said, I'm going to go back to before creation and I'm going to tell you what God did and what it's all about. So the gospel of John goes back before the earth was created. And it said, in, in the first verse says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God and without him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse, and it goes on to describe, and then in verse 14 it said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld him as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Yeah. And Jesus, in, in that same chapter, Jesus told us that he was the light that lights every man that comes into this world. So all of us are born with some light on the inside of us. That's why, that's why no matter where you go, uh, backwoods somewhere, people that have never heard of Jesus, they, they just found, found him you know, on the backside of somewhere. They don't, don't know about civilization or anything like that, and yet they'll be worshiping something. The reason why is because all of us are born with a light on the inside of us that says to us, there is something greater than you are. Well, in other words, we're born wanting to worship something that is greater than us because we recognize we have, we have a God-shaped vacuum on the inside of ourselves, actually. It's like, it's like a, a little hole in ourselves that looks like God, and, 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 this, and this vacuum is, is drawing you know, out, of, out, out of the spirit and is drawing itself in, and, and, and you know, we're, we're trying to figure out what it is, and, and, and we can't know, we don't know, but we just say, you know, uh, my life is so empty. Uh, uh, I'm bored. I, I'm, I'm, I'm restless. My life is meaningless. Uh, what, do, uh, what do I need? Where do I go? What do I do? And, and then even when we get what we want, uh, it seems like we don't want what we get. Yeah. The, those unlikely theologians, the Rolling Stones, uh, 
back in the 60s, I think it was about 1965 or so, they came out with a song um, called Satisfaction. And you remember the chorus, and you remember the first line of the chorus is, I can't get no satisfaction. Though I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. I can't get no. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mick Jagger, he's still singing that song. How old is he, about 75 or 80? Keith Richards looks like he's about 99. He. He died, though, about 15 years ago and just doesn't have the good grace to lay down. <laughs> if, you see, if you see him, he looks like, of course, he's looked like that all of his life. I mean, hadn't changed a bit, really, you know. But, man, I'm telling you, this is, what, uh, 50 years later? They're still singing that same song. The reason why is because that lyric uh, grabbed our hearts and stuck us. You know why? Uh, because... Uh, uh, we still feel that way. Society still feels that way. I know baby boomers and X generation and Gen Z and Gen whatever and, you know, millennials and whatever you might call yourself, every generation has heard that kind of lyric and go, golly, that's so right. I can't get no satisfaction. I'm trying and I'm trying. I can't get satisfied with things. Well, this fourth beatitude, God says, look, I'm going to tell you how to get satisfied with this emptiness that you feel on the inside because I'm the one that put it there. And you keep trying to fill it up with a bunch of stuff that's not going to fill it up because it's an empty spot in you that's designed for me. And if, if I don't tell you how to fill it up, you'll spend the rest of your life trying to fill it up with things that won't satisfy in life. You remember about... Four weeks ago, we started this series, and I shared with you in the first message about happiness, and I, we went to the book of Ecclesiastes, and I told you that, you know, the, the word Ecclesiastes means the preacher, and it was written by Solomon. Uh, this is David, King David's son, Solomon, him, he and Bathsheba's second son. You remember the first one died within seven days of his birth, but this is the second one. And Solomon's ruling the kingdom now that David's dead and gone. He, he becomes the king of Israel. And he, 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 does, he has everything at his command. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set out to find happiness in life. And he, and he just let himself go. He just went wild with whatever he wanted to do in search of real happiness in life. And he had unlimited resources. He had unlimited opportunities. He was the king of an empire, the king of a nation. He, I mean, he had it all. And, 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 and as you read through the chapters, you, you, you hear him say, uh, I tried this and I tried this. I tried, you know, I tried laughter, I tried liquor, I tried luxury, I tried learning, I, you know, I, I tried laughter in life, I tried lust in life. And he describes all of the things he tries and he comes to the conclusion, he said, it's all vanity, it's like chasing the wind, you know, it's like trying to catch the wind, it's just vain to search for happiness like that. And he came up with basically, or I came up with three categories. You may, might remember them, accumulating things, experiencing pleasure, and achieving success. Uh, life, we spend our life trying to do those three things. Uh, advertisement is trying to encourage us to do those three things. Let's just, let's just hit them again real quick. What do we try to do? Well, uh, I, I, I call it in, in this particular outline, uh, you can't get satisfaction no lasting satisfaction in possessions. We have millions of products in, in our market today that have the slogan, satisfaction guaranteed, right? <laughs> well, I would venture to say that we have five to 10 times, maybe even more, I have no way of really numbering it, but we, I, I guarantee you we have it five to 10 times more products today than we had even 10 short years ago. And their motto is satisfaction guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But are you five to 10 times more satisfied today than you were back then? No, because nowadays, even when you get what you want, uh, you don't want what you get. It, it, it doesn't satisfy like it, like it should. Look, here's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity, he said. 
In other words, Solomon says it's foolish to think that wealth is going to bring happiness in life. Poor folks think if I could just get lots of money, then I would be happy in life. Of course, people that have money know that that's not true at all. Matter of fact, we, our generation grew up with, uh, with, with some TV programs called soap operas. Do, do, do any of you remember soap operas? <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, sitting on the edge of night without a guiding light, trying to search for tomorrow. Got caught in a secret storm, sure as the world turns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you young people might not even know what I'm talking about, but these were daily, these were daily TV shows. I think some of them still come on, and they came on every day. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and and there were two things that we learned from soap operas. One is nobody worked anywhere. I, that was a, that was the most amazing thing. Nobody nobody went to work. I mean, the reason they had so many affairs and so much mess and junk going on in their life is they didn't have anything else to do. I mean, you know, they didn't have to go to a job, or work. They were all rich. Every one of them were rich, but none of them ever went to work. And the second thing we learned is uh, they were never happy. It was always something happening that made them <laughs> unhappy. So, you know, we got reminded right there that money and possessions and things don't bring happiness. Sol Solomon said, if you chase after silver, if, if that's your God, you, you, you're never going to be happy with silver. And if you give, go search for abundance, you're never going to be happy with abundance. So, so it's not a thing about possessions. It's also not a thing about performance. You don't find lasting satisfaction in performance. Workaholics discover this. Um, perfectionists discover this. That that you're not gonna that you're not gonna uh, find true fulfillment and true joy in some kind of performance that you that you do in life. Look 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 at what Solomon said. For what has man for all his labor? Now this is going to be pretty pessimistic. But look at him, he says, for what has man for all of his labor and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all of his days, all of his days are sorrowful and his work burdensome. Even in the night, his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. What, 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 what's he saying? He's Solomon saying, well, we got... We work all the time and, and, and we, we achieve things and achieve, go, we work our way up the ladder and we, and we are, become successful, but it's like, you know, wasted days and sleepless nights. Made me think of a Freddie Fender. You know, <laughs> wasted days and wasted nights. Y'all remember that classic? This is Nostalgia Day at Freedom Room. Yeah. That's what he. That's what Solomon's saying. Solomon's saying, "Look, you know, if you're living to achieve something, I'm going to tell you, you're going to work hard, and and, it's, and you're going to be sorrowful in the daytime, and you're going to be sleepless at night. I mean, that's pretty pessimistic. Well, I mean, look at that's verse 22 and 20. Look at look, look at verse 21. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. That means." Uh, you're, you're a person and you have wisdom and you have knowledge and you have skill and that's going to bless you in life and it's going to help you rise up the ladder. Uh, yet, he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This is also vanity and great evil. In other words, uh, uh, I'm going to work hard all of my life and I'm going to develop great achievement and great rewards and great performance because I've got wisdom and skill and understanding, and then I'm going to die, and somebody that didn't have to work for it is going to inherit it, and, uh, and, and they're not going to know what to do with it, and they're going to waste it because uh, while you're making it and earning it, you're also building your character so you'll know how to handle it. You ever notice people that come into money and they've never had any in their life? Have you ever noticed what happens to them? Like lottery winners or, or big big gamblers, and they, you know they, they all of a sudden get rich, or these uh, or these athletes that get you know a 19 million dollar signing bonus, and then within one year after they get out, uh, they're broke. They, they they're declaring bankruptcy. Why? Because their character can't handle it. Uh, they didn't they didn't develop themselves, and they didn't develop the character to go with the opportunities that that. But but anyway. Uh, it's about performance. It's about being successful in life. And so uh, Solomon said, look, you're not going to find lasting happiness in possessions. You're not going to find la lasting happiness in performance. And you're not going to find lasting happiness in, in pleasure in life. 
I mean, you know how it goes. If I could just... Um, if I could just take a cruise or if I could just retire in luxury or if I could travel the world, <laughs> then I would be happy. Now Solomon says this in verse 8 of chapter 1, all things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing nor the ear filled with hearing. In other words, no matter how much we see and how much we, we hear, we are never satisfied in life. He says, pleasure's not going to satisfy you because your ears and your eyes are never going to see enough and hear enough and receive enough pleasure to fill up your, your life. Isn't it interesting that most advertisement is pushed toward uh, having pleasure in life? You're, to encourage you to be dissatisfied with where you are and what you're doing and the fact that you need this new product to be happy or you need this new experience to be happy. You need to experience this in order to be happy. Uh, in the old days, back when I was growing up, uh, we had cigarette advertisements. You guys remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Everybody smoked back then. And even the doctors came on t TV, and I'm serious. Even the doctors came on TV and encouraged people to smoke because it settled them down. It calmed them down, you know, and that, that, and they didn't know about nicotine really back then. But anyway, there were cigarette commercials on TV. And I don't even remember the brand, but I do remember the slogan for the brand. It says, the taste that satisfies. I, I don't know whether it was Camel, Pall Mall, whatever it was. But anyway, it, it, the, the slogan was, the taste that satisfies. Now, that's not true. Because if it was true, what that would mean is, all, all I need is one puff. And I'm satisfied. I wouldn't need another puff. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't need another cigarette. Uh, the taste that satisfies. No, 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 no. How, how many of you have been on a late night refrigerator raid and uh, you get up, you get up and you go look in the refrigerator and you don't know what you want. And so you nibble on almost everything in there and, and, uh, and nothing hits a spot and you go back to bed and you're not satisfied. Well, it's surprising how many people live life like that, uh, never knowing what they want, always trying to find something that'll bring happiness into their life. And it gets so bad that some people even take matters into their own hands and they drink up or they shoot up or they, you know, uh, sex it up or, or whatever uh, dysfunctional thing you want to try to do to create happiness in your life. But the book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 11 that the pleasures of sin only last for a season. That's the Bible's way of saying uh, what happens in sinful pursuit is a law called the law of diminishing returns, which basically says if you're pursuing anything that's not godly. Now, this, I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, give you a little secret. If you pursue godly things, God is going to bless your life. So that as you pursue godly things, your experience is going to get deeper and deeper and greater and greater. Yeah, your happiness and your joy and, 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 and the areas of your life are going to become more and more full. And you're going to, I mean, I'm just telling you, you can't get too much of Jesus, all right? Let's just say it like that. You can't go to seed on Jesus. You can't get too much of Jesus. But if it's anything ungodly, what's going to happen is the more you do it, the less return you're going to get. It's going to take more and more of that to get the same buzz that you had. You know, a month ago, it took uh, uh, two ounces. Now it takes four ounces. Uh, a couple of months from now, it's going to take six ounces. A couple of months, you're going to be drinking a, a fifth to get the same buzz you used to get with two ounces. Why? Because of diminishing returns. The more you do it, the less good you experience out of it. And that's what Hebrews says about pleasure in life. So you can't find happiness in pleasure. You can't find it in possessions. You know, you can't find it in success in life and performance. And, and so what then is the secret to satisfaction? How could we answer Mick Jagger's question <laughs> Or his, his challenge, I can't get no satisfaction. How can you get some satisfaction? Look at Psalms 37. Let's read that top line together, all right? Just the top line. 
Delight yourself also in the Lord. Let's read it again. Delight yourself also in the Lord. Do it one more time. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And look, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So how is it that we find satisfaction in the life, in our life? Well, that verse says that, uh, that we seek the Lord. That's in, and when we seek the Lord, when we delight ourselves in the Lord, then he's going to do something. He's going to give us uh, the desires of our life. Kind of reminds you of Matthew 6 where Jesus said in the same Sermon on the Mount that we're in right now, just one chapter later, he said, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And, and what, somebody fi finish it? And all these things will be added unto you. <laughs> In other words, Jesus and the writer of, of Psalms here are saying the same thing. And that is, if you want to find happiness in life, don't seek happiness. Seek the Lord. If you, if you go around trying to seek happiness in life, let me tell you, you're never going to find it. You're always going to be pursuing something that's not there because you can't find happiness trying to seek happiness. You find happiness see seeking the Lord. In other words, happiness is a byproduct of seeking the Lord. You, you, he said, seek me first. That's right. And then the byproduct of that is I'm going to give you happiness or delight yourself in me and I'm going to give you happiness in life. So this, this cute little phrase, um, happiness is found in the Lord, is not just a little cliche refrigerator verse. It's a promise from God. Well, how do you get, how do you find satisfaction in the Lord? How do I experience satisfaction in my life? What is it that I need to do to seek the Lord? so that he can give me satisfaction in life. Well, I got three steps for you real quick, all right? This is what you need to do, number one. Step number one, I need to recognize my real hunger. All right, ask yourself, what is it in my life that's missing? Or uh, what's not there? Any of, you, any of you play this game, you're going out to eat, you get in the automobile, you look at, you guys, you look at your wife and you say, uh, uh, well, where, where, what you hungry for? And she says, uh, I don't know what you hungry for. And you say, I don't know. I mean, kids, what, 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 do, you, what do you want? And uh, uh, let's pretend they say, I don't know. Um, <laughs> they're going to usually say uh, something chicken nuggets or something another like that, a French fry chicken nugget. I mean, I'm telling you, if it wasn't for French fries and chicken nuggets, kids would go out of business nowadays. It's ridiculous, man. But anyway, the point is uh, that, that, that uh, that's okay for going out to eat to, to just say, I, I don't know what I'm hungry for. I, I don't have any idea. But, but it's amazing when some people try to live life like that. I mean, some people's life is like that. Where, where am I going? I, I, I don't know. What do I need? I, uh, I don't know. What am I searching for? Phew, wish I knew. I wish I could tell you. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going in this direction, that direction, my direction, that direction. I don't know. What, what am I doing in life? So I'm just saying to seek God, the first thing that it takes is you've got to recognize what you are really hungry for, right? And the Lord said, delight yourself in me, and I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. Uh, seek me first, and I'm going to add all these things to you. So if I'm going to seek him that means I've got to know what I'm hungry for. And I'm just telling you that what you're hungry for is something that God has put on the inside of you when he created you. He created you with this God-shaped vacuum on the inside that can't be filled up with anything but him because he's the one that made it in you. And until you get in relationship with him and you stay in relationship and you pursue him, you're going to be hungry for something that you don't even know what it is. 
You're not going to be satisfied no matter how much you try to fill it up with something else because what you're really hungry, hunger for is you're really hungering for God. And God is trying to help you see that. You say, how in the world is God trying to help me see that my hunger, my real hunger is for him? Well, we have a perfect picture of it in the book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> yeah, go all the way back, yeah. What is this picture? How many of you remember uh, the children of Israel? They get led out in the desert by Charlton Heston, and he parts <laughs> Yeah, the movie Ten Commandments that comes on a thousand times a year. Yeah, you know, Charlton Heston plays Moses and, and he leads the children out of, Egypt, uh, out of Egypt where they've been slaves and then he opens the Red Sea with a tap and God does it and then God leads them out into the desert and for 40 years they wander around the desert, right? With God taking care of them and God doing lots of stuff and, and all of that. Uh, this, is, this is that time and, and this is just an example of what God does in lives in order to try to get us to recognize that our real hunger is for him, all right? Look in verse, verse, and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. Why'd you do it, God? I mean, why did we wander around for 40 years out here in the desert? He says, to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. Uh, I think God already knew, you know, really. I think he just wanted them to know, you know. He wanted them to get a good look at themselves. So why did God, why did God, I mean, God could have took, taken them out of Egypt and, and, and the next day could have walked them into the promised land if that's what God had wanted to do. But God, no, they wandered around for 40 years. Why? Because God for 40 years tried to teach that stubborn bunch of people that what they really needed was him. Yeah. And they were rebellious and hard-headed and blind and stubborn and ridiculous. And it took 40 years to let them see that what they really needed was to depend on God. And how did he accomplish this? Well, the next verse says, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. What is that verse saying? That verse is saying the way God helps you understand that your real hunger is for him is he lets you get hungry. He lets you get problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He lets circumstances come into your life. Yeah. He allows issues to come against you. Mm -hmm. He allows the enemy to attack and move against you. Mm -hmm. why? Why, 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 why? Why would he do that? So you'll get hungry. Like I said, you fat, happy, and sassy, nobody can tell you anything. Yeah, you cocky and arrogant. Got life by the tail on a downhill pull. I mean, you know, everything's good, everything's fine. You can't tell me nothing, man. God, I, I got it all. I'm blessed, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're not hungry for anything, right? Yeah, mm, no, man, I'm fat, happy, and sassy, and I got it all. God says... You're not even aware of what you're hungry for. Mm -hmm. So here comes a circumstance. Here comes an issue. Here comes a hurt. Here comes a problem. Here comes, and that's God's way of getting your attention and, and, and to make sure you know that, that what you really need is him. Yeah. So you say, I'm so miserable. I'm dissatisfied. My life is a stinking mess. I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken. I'm dissatisfied. I mean, I don't even know what's wrong with me in life. And I would just say, congratulations. Mm -hmm. What? Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Because now you're hungry. And you might have tried everything. You, you might have tried pleasure and performance and possessions. And I'm just going to ask you, are you satisfied? Mm -hmm. Are you really, really satisfied? God says, 
that life is not all about those things. Jesus said, it's about me. It, it, it's, it, it's re I'm ready to meet that need. I'm ready to fill up your life. See, he created that, huh? he created that, that shape in you, and he's ready to fill that up. But you got to be hungry for him. Yeah. And you've got to delight yourself in him, and you've got to uh, 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 seek these things first, and then he can bring happiness into your life. Notice also it says he humbled you and allowed you to hunger. So hungry people are humble people. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you take a beggar off the street who, who hadn't had anything to eat, and you give him a little food, you know, he... He doesn't, he's not, he doesn't care whether you give him a plate, a napkin, a fork, a spoon. Or, I mean, just, just give me some food. You know, hungry people are humble people. Also, hunger is very painful, but it, it does motivate us. So do you have a problem today? Is there an issue floating around and you're concerned with it and it bothering you? Well, congratulations. That's God who wants to fill your life with what you're really hunger, hungry for, and that hunger is to know him. So the first thing you have to do in order to be happy is you got to recognize that it's not these other things that are going to fill your life up. Your real hunger is that you would know God in a real way. Yeah, yeah. Second step, stop eating spiritual junk food. My real hunger is for God, but I can fill my life up with a lot of spiritual things. You get me? Spiritual things, spiritual sounding things, spiritual looking things. And I can convince myself that that is really true, nutritious, spiritual food. And uh, it's just spiritual junk food in life. Look. This is what Isaiah said. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Isaiah said, if you eat the right stuff, and of course he's talking about in a spiritual manner, in a spiritual way of life. If you eat the right spiritual uh, goodness in life, your heart is going to have abundance. That's what he said. So stop wasting your time and your money on things that don't really satisfy you in life, is what Isaiah said. Your hunger is crying out for God, so stop trying to satisfy your hunger for God with spiritual junk food in life. Well, from the vault of worthless information, let me share one with you. Uh, um, there's a plant in Australia called nardu. It's, a, it's like a little clover fern, and its spores are used to, by the people uh, to, to make bread or uh, to put in soup over there. And uh, the, the issue with nardu is that it has no protein, it has no carbohydrates, and it has no vitamins, which those three are the essentials for life, right? protein, carbs, and vitamins in it. It has none of those. So the people who depend on Nardu to be a big part of their, <laughs> big part of their nourishment regimen, they have their stomachs filled, but they eventually die because it has no protein, no carbs, and, and no vitamins in life. Now, that sounds like a lot of di <laughs> diets, I know, as a matter of fact. Uh, but... Uh, it's something that you can get filled with, now hear me, but you're not satisfied. Now, there's a difference between being full and being satisfied. And the Lord says, you know what you need? You need to be full. You need to be satisfied. So you can't eat something that is not designed to feed your soul. We live in a land of artificial amusement today. We have more junk food to fill up our time and spend our money on than any other generation in the history of the world. We move from thrilled to thrilled for the entertainment to entertainment, uh, thinking that this new, this new thing, that new thing is what we need, and, and that'll make us happy, and that'll make it uh, satisfied, and it might... Uh, for, for a few hours, <laughs> maybe a day or two, 
but it's not going to satisfy us. It's interesting to notice, I think, how much our appetites are influenced by who we associate with. Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, who you hang around determines what you're, you're, you're hungry for. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that when you get around a group of hungry people, you get hungry? Or have you ever noticed it with your kids? It's really easy to see. You let one of your, one of your children come home and announce, Mom, I'm hungry. And what do all the other kids do? They're starving to death also. Because what we, those that are around us influence the way we think about, about things. So my, my point is, Whoever you're hungry, whoever you hang around determines what you're hungry for. If you if you're hang around people that are concerned about the latest fads and the new trinkets and uh, the new programs and the new video games and, the, and, and all those kind of things in life, guess what you're going to be hungry for? You're going to be hungry for... Uh, all of the latest fads and the newest games and, 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 and the latest movies and, and all, of this, all this stuff that's not going to satisfy your life. Plenty to fill it up with, but not going to be satisfied. So you may be full, but you're not satisfied. Uh, our land is full of uh, uh, religions and cults and so forth that tell us, now listen to how ridiculous this is, that tell us, you know what you need to do? You need to find spiritual uh, fullness. And then they say, you know how you find it? You, you find it within yourself. Yeah, I mean, get, spiritual fulfillment comes from within you. So uh, what you need to do is fill yourself. And I think, how dumb is that? Uh, because I'm thinking, you, you, when you're hungry, you don't do that. How, how many of you, when you're hungry, you look at your stomach and you say, all right, stomach, uh, feed yourself. Good, I'm filled. No, no. When we're hungry, in order to get satisfied, we can't feed ourselves from within ourselves, right? I mean, you have to go to an outside source, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta put something in there. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go somewhere yeah. to where that where that source is, and then get it from there, and then put it in, and then you can be filled with with whatever it is you're hungry for. So uh, step one is recognize your real hunger. God created you with a God-shaped vacuum. You're hungry for him. Number two, stop eating spiritual junk food. Quit trying to fill your th life with things that don't satisfy. They may fill you up temporarily, but they're not going to satisfy your life. And step three, start looking to Christ for satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Start looking to Jesus for satisfaction. You remember, seek me first. The kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Uh, here's in the Gospel of John, just a couple of verses, and I'll be finished. And Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. Yeah, yeah. To that I say, wow. <laughs> right? Wow. That's wonder bread, isn't it, B? I'm telling you. Yeah, that's Wonder Bread. He says, you eat of me, and you're not ever going to get hungry in life. All right. Bread is the basic food of life. Right, Lawrence? Right. <laughs> Ain't nothing but some bread, right? Bread is the basic food of life. You know, I've heard people testify that they've lived for umpteen years off of nothing but bread and water, right? Bread is a source of life. That's why one of the first things that happen when a land has famine or disaster, what do, what do we fly in? We fly in a, a, a pallets of wheat. Why? Because you use wheat to make bread from, and if they can just get a little bit of bread, they can at least make it until supplies can get in. You know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, you need me. I am the source of life. And what you're looking for is me, and you need me. I'm it. I am what you're looking for. And all of the promises of all of these spiritual movements, uh, these new movements of the Spirit that are not really new, but are basically uh, old, the old mysticism with, uh, with, a, with some makeup put on it, uh, that, that try to teach us that that we can find satisfaction in ourselves or find satisfaction in something we do. 
is a waste of life. You're, you, God's created you with this vacuum and you have to use it. it he's the only thing that can, can fill it up and you can't fill yourself up from the inside no, no, no easier than you could tell your own stomach to fill itself from the inside. No, you got to go to an outside force. Look, you can't say to yourself, uh, be your own God because you don't have the resources to be your own God. You have to go to an outside source, right? And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, all right, I am that outside source. I am that one that came. I am the one that you're looking for. Notice in the verse, he said, and Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. All right, he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, then they're never going to they're never going to die. So what Jesus is saying here is Jesus is saying in order to be satisfied, you, you have to come, you have to believe, and you have to take me in. And when when you're hungry, for something, what do you do? You take action, right? When you're hungry for something, you get up, you go find something, you, you take action. And then when you take it, then you put it in. In other words, you feed it in. Uh, he says same thing's true spiritually as it is physically. You, you got you to gotta take some action in life. So if you're hungry or uh, uh, thirst. I hadn't really even mentioned thirst. thirst. Your thirst is more essential than hunger, actually. You can live longer without food than you can without water. And what did Jesus say to uh, the woman at the well? You know, he, that, he used water, right? Remember the woman at the well? What did she say? Uh, she said, can you, can you give me some water? Uh, that, I came out to get some water. Can you give me some water? He said, ma'am, I can give you lots of water. He said, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, he said, he said, I can give you a water that if you'll drink of it, you'll never be thirsty again. And she said, Lord, forevermore, give me this water. And she said, you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get the water? <laughs> and he said, look, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never die, will never thirst, but the water I shall give him will become a fountain of water springing up from the inside. And so Jesus is saying, you know, what you need is you need me. And if you'll take some action, you're not going to be able to just receive it without taking some action. If you'll take some action, you, you can have it. So what's the point? Here's the point. Appetites aren't filled until you do something about it. How can you have your physical hunger filled and thirst filled? Get up, go get some food, put it in your stomach, swallow it, and you can be filled in life. Jesus is saying, you need me, and if you're going to have me, you're going to have to take some action. So can I really be content in life? Can I be satisfied? Uh, yeah, it's up to you.